California is recognized. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I suspect that uh, all of us, all 435 of us, went back to our districts during the uh, August recess. And I would expect that uh, most every member of this House heard what I heard. The gentleman will suspend. The House is not in order. Take your conversations outside of the chamber. I suspect that uh, all of us who are listening heard the same message. When can I go back to work? When will there be a job for me? I'm going to lose my house because I've lost my job. My kids, I can't afford to put my kids through school. You guys have got to get the job engine working once again. You've got to get Americans back to work. Well, we are back here at work, and we're probably the 257th day of this Congress. And yet, the Republican majority has yet to put one jobs-creating bill on the floor. Now, they put a lot of bills on the floor, all of which would actually reduce employment. You cut the budgets, you're cutting somebody's job. Fortunately, last week, the President of the United States came before this Congress, stood there where the Speaker is now standing, and presented to the American people an answer to the question that all of us heard during the recess. And he said, we can and we will put Americans back to work when Congress acts on his Jobs Act. The American Jobs Act is now before the United States Congress and the United States Senate. And it's time for us to act so that Americans can go back to work. Some say we could delay until after the next election. It will be 17 months, just short of a year and a half, before the next Congress will be in session and will be able to pass legislation. There is not an unemployed American in this nation that can or wants to wait 17 months to get a job. We have the opportunity today to put Americans back to work with the American Jobs Act. The American Jobs Act works. It works. Americans can immediately go back to work as soon as that legislation is passed by this House and the Senate and put on the President's desk. This afternoon, we're going to take maybe an hour with my colleagues to talk about various parts of the American Jobs Act. And we're going to start right now with a representative from Illinois. Ms. Jan, if you would join us. And you talked earlier about this very eloquently on the steps of the Capitol. Please share with us. Personal twist to, to all this about jobs. When, when I grew up in Chicago, I was the daughter of a fur, furniture salesman and a Chicago public school teacher. The American dream was alive and well. On my dad's modest income, we could afford a, a, a little house in a quiet, middle-class neighborhood. And back then, a, a man could work in the steel mills in Chicago, on Chicago's south side. One good union job with family health care benefits and a decent pension and really live a middle-class life. The family could own a home and buy a car and even send the kids to college. That was the 1950s, and anything seemed possible if you were willing to work hard. Incomes were growing up for everyone, income inequality was shrinking, and Americans were experiencing the greatest growth in living standards in history. For most working families, that American dream was in reach, and that was the normal. But today, after decades of attacks on organized labor and passage of tax policies that favor wealthy individuals and corporations and growing disparity in income, the squandering of a budget surplus, and the turning of a blind eye to Wall Street greed and recklessness, that dream is drowning in a sea of joblessness. And I feel like the Republicans are pushing this 
as the new normal, that the rich get richer and the rest of the country gets poorer. But fortunately, our president, President Barack Obama, has made it perfectly clear that we are not helpless in the face of our daunting but man-made economic challenges. And he has proposed a jobs bill that will immediately improve people's lives and jumpstart the economy. And you know, the, the answer to this jobs crisis is surprisingly simple. If you want to create jobs, create jobs, good jobs, jobs that can provide people with a middle class life, rebuild our middle class. Jobs like the 35,000 uh, schools that under the President's bill will be repaired. There are, there are children all over this country right now that are sitting in classrooms where the ceilings are crumbling, They're, that have dangerous asbestos in them, that are leaking energy, that don't have the wiring for the new technologies that our children need to succeed in this world and get those 21st century jobs. We don't have the kind of schools and classrooms in which our children are going to be able to compete in this 21st century world. And at the same time, we have hundreds and thousands of construction workers and electricians and boiler makers and uh, maintenance workers that are jobless right now, that are sitting home unemployed, who are more than willing to roll up their sleeves and give our school children the kind of classrooms that they deserve. So here we have a tremendous need and we have the people that can answer that need. Not only will they be back to work, but it will jumpstart our economy and be good for everyone. It is not rocket science. We can do this, and we need to do it now. As the President said, the election isn't until 14 months from now, and the Republicans seem to want to adjudicate this issue at that time. But this isn't about politics. This is about all those families who simply want a job. They don't want to be receiving unemployment benefits. They want to pay taxes, as a matter of fact. And if we want to reduce the deficit, jobs are the answer once again. Jobs equal deficit reduction. That's why we can't wait to pass this American Jobs Act. We need to enlist the help of all Americans to call their members of Congress, Republicans and Democrats, I'm talking about the people out there, regardless of party, to say we need to pass this right now. This is the way that we can get back to what the normal was when I was growing up, when there was opportunity. People lived a middle class life. Instead, we're watching that middle class disappear, that American dream slip through our fingers, and the economy it needs to be revived. The President has the answer. We need to do it now. Thank you. I thank the uh, gentlelady from Illinois who speaks so eloquently on this. Uh, as you were talking about the schools, 44 percent of the principals across this nation say clearly that their school is not up to the standard that they want to have their own children in. Classrooms, uh, painting, uh, paint on the walls are falling off, bathrooms are inadequate, playgrounds and the like. 35,000 35, schools across this country can be repaired, can be rebuilt. New classrooms, science classrooms, upgrading the uh, internet, internet systems in these schools and the playgrounds. All of that's possible. And how correct you are when you say, there are men and women out there that are ready to do that work. These are a lot of jobs. This isn't heavy equipment work. This is heavy person power work. Can Let's I, put I, these people to work, please. Can I say one more thing about it? These are jobs that can be created right away. 
You know, I'm, I'm from the Midwest, so we actually have a, a construction season. But for fixing schools, you can do that around the, the year, around the calendar. We can put these people to work within uh, a, a few months. They can be on the job earning, earning money. This is such a sensible program. Actually, in discussing this with the, uh, with the administration, the day the bill is signed, the schools can begin the work. Because the process, the administrative process, is, is very straightforward. So this is a very, very important one. We're talking 35,000 schools, several, perhaps several hundred thousand, or a couple hundred thousand men and women going to work immediately to repair our schools. And wouldn't that give us community pride? Our school, my school is getting repaired. It's getting a paint job. The toilets are getting fixed. The classroom, the science classroom. This is community pride. This is American pride in our most basic of investments, the investment in our children. And you know, you're, the, the, the sign you have there says that poor conditions of their schools interfere with students learning. So we are also depriving our children of that sense of pride that will motivate them to be good students, to learn, to be ready to take over in this 21st century job market. And one of my favorite subjects is making it in America. The way the legislation is written, when that paint, that gallon of paint, when that heating air conditioning system is brought to the school, it or the playground equipment, it's going to be made in America. It's going to be made in America because the legislation that the president brought to us says that the money will be used to buy equipment made in America. I noticed that our colleague from Maryland has joined us. Uh, if you would, I know we were talking earlier about some of your favorite subjects. I believe it was infrastructure. And so uh, please, if you will, Donna. Join us on this conversation. Well, I want to thank Donna the Edwards. I want to thank the gentleman um, because I think that we've received some rather sobering news about the state of America, the state of American workers, the state of Americans, and it is that uh, for uh, here we are at a time when we've reached the highest poverty rates in 52 years in this country, where median incomes are down lower than they've been in a generation, 7% less, in fact, than what median incomes were even in 1999, where nearly a third of African American families in this country live in poverty, where millions upon millions of children in this country go to bed hungry because they live in poverty, because their families, their parents don't have a chance for a job and an opportunity. And I think that that should be sobering news for us, not as Democrats and Republicans. It should be sobering news for us as Americans. And that's why when I heard President Obama in this House speaking to the American people about the need to create jobs right now, I know what I heard was a message that said, you know, I suppose with the politics, we could politic this out for 14 months, that we could fight amongst ourselves as Democrats and Republicans for 14 months, that we could in the political arena just raise millions and millions of dollars to run campaign ads and make uh, annoying phone calls to people across this country for 14 months, or we could take a different path. We could take a path that's really about creating jobs and opportunities for people who are living in poverty for Americans who want to work right now. I had a really interesting experience uh, for me um, over uh, the break that the Congress had. I visited the new Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial with my mother. My mother who was born at the beginning of the Depression. My mother who lived in a community in North Carolina where she'd visit the local town and had segregated water fountains where people really struggled. They were farmers who struggled greatly to put food on the table. And on the way to the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial, we passed the memorial to FDR. And I saw there the statues 
representing people who were standing in employment lines and in food lines. And I saw the words of that wonderful president who recognized that he had to get beyond the politics to a point where we were creating jobs, not just meaningless jobs, but jobs that were about rebuilding the nation's infrastructure, that were about putting people to work so that they could put food on their table so that they could make a contribution to this country. And so as I walked, as we walked from the FDR Memorial over to the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial, I said to myself that the United States right now in this time of great need with 14 million people unemployed, that we need an FDR moment, that the American people need an FDR moment, and that that moment has to be about creating jobs for people right here in America, for rebuilding our manufacturing sector, for investing in research and development and innovation and creativity, for taking those 150,000 bridges across this country that are falling apart, and I know when I drive over a bridge, I don't say, is this a Republican bridge or is this a Democratic bridge? What I say, is this a bridge that can get my car over that waterway safely? And when I look at that bridge and I see the steel beams, I know that those are steel beams manufactured by people right here in the United States. When I look at the asphalt and the cement that covers that bridge, I see work that took place right here in the United States. When I look at those bridges and these 150,000 bridges all across the country that need to be rebuilt by hardworking Americans, what I see are the light posts up by the bridge with the electricity running through them or the solar panels on them that are put there and built there by American workers. And so when the president says to pass the American Jobs Act right away, the reason he's saying that is because those are jobs right now for hardworking Americans who actually want to work hard building things in the, this country, rebuilding all of our infrastructure, our bridges, our roadways, our water and sewer systems that are falling apart. They want to do this. And I think it's really incumbent on us to do it. And I think that the American people ought to hold each and every one of us to account for failing to do it. And I note, as Mr. Garamendi is showing here, and we will see, that nearly 2 million construction workers across this country are unemployed. When our colleague Jan Schakowsky from Illinois talks about the 35,000 schools that need to be reconstructed for the 21st century so that our young people can learn in a 21st century learning environment, not just because it feels good, but because it will make a difference to our own competitiveness for the 21st century. What I know is that those are those two million construction workers who are unemployed across this country who can do that work in our schools, in their communities. And so I think that this is a real imperative. And I would just urge our colleagues to look beyond the D and an R and look to a job for the American people who are asking us to do this for them, but also to do this for us. I don't, I don't know how it is that we survive in a global economy when we're not producing anything, when we're not putting our people back to work, when we're not engaged in rebuilding all of our infrastructure that was decades in the making from FDR and beyond and is now falling apart. I owe that to my mother and my grandmother and my grandfather for the generation that did all of that for us. We owe it to them not to allow it to fall apart. And so I say, yes, let's pass the American Jobs Act now. Representative Edwards, thank you so very much for your compassion and passion for these issues. Uh, bringing FDR, the monument, and Martin Luther King together 
around this set of issues is really important. This is the worst economy since the Great Depression. And I remember on one of those plaques at the FDR Memorial, and I, I may get this wrong a little bit, but he said, we measure our progress not by how much, by those who get, who have much, they have more, but those who have little have enough. He had the compassion. And uh, last week, the president brought to us an answer to the compelling question that we hear. What are you going to do about jobs? The American Jobs Act, and you, spent, you spoke so eloquently about the infrastructure, the streets, the bridges, schools. Two million construction workers are out of jobs. The president has proposed a $50 billion immediate infusion of money into America's infrastructure, into our roads, our bridges, our water systems, uh, our airports. $50 billion available this year to put Americans back to work. And it's not just the construction workers that will have those jobs. Because these people will be able to keep their homes, they'll be able to buy the food, they'll be able to bring that money back into their economy with what is called the multiplier effect. And so that $50 billion may run through the economy three times, two and a half times, so that instead of two million, maybe it'll be three million that'll get their jobs. I know you want to add to this, Ms. Edwards, so please. I, I just want to, and thank you for that, I just want to remind our colleagues that for every one billion dollars, one billion dollars, that we invest in repairing the nation's infrastructure, we create 35,000 jobs, $1 billion, 35,000 jobs. And so the multiplier effect is really tremendous. It is the construction worker on the site, but it's also the canteen truck that drives up that's the small business person at that site. It's the engineers and uh, all of the technicians who've developed that amazing engineering for these construction sites. It's the architects who are designing a revamped school in a neighborhood uh, to educate our children to compete in the 21st century. One billion dollars equals 35,000 jobs. Well, there you have it, and that's when we have the opportunity. If we act now, if this chamber, empty but for the three of us, and our staffs here and the desk crew were to act tomorrow on the legislation that the president has brought before us. It's in proper form. It's before us. We could take it up. And these people, all that you talked about, could be at work in the next couple of weeks. That's the possibility. I noticed our friend from the great mid-America, Mr. Cohen, Please join us and share with us uh, your thoughts from Middle America. Uh, Ms. Edwards, thank you so very much for joining us and for your eloquency and your determination to make this happen. Mr. Thank Cohen. you. I appreciate your having leading this, uh, this hour. Um, it was just last week the President stood just behind where you're standing and addressed this Congress, uh, bipartisan, uh, bicameral, senators, House members, and laid out a plan to put America to work and to fix this economy. Pass this bill, he said, and we need to pass the bill. The president and his team have put a lot of work into it, and people want jobs. They want to work. In my district, there are more unemployed. Every weekend when I go out in my district, people come up to me and tell me that they've either looking for a job, have lost their job, looking for a job. We need to find ways to put those people to work. Working on making schools better, building infrastructure that's so important to Memphis, Tennessee, where we have rails, roads, rivers, and runways. Distribution Center of America is so important. And if you put the money in infrastructure, which this plan plans on, make it in America, you, you do it in infrastructure, it's got to be made in America. You can't export those jobs overseas then you put people to work immediately, but what they're building are avenues that make commerce move and work. Federal Express moves more packages around the world than any other uh, American company, and Memphis International Airport is the largest American cargo airport in the world. We create jobs by putting money into infrastructure. 
uh, teachers, policemen, and firemen. Three million kept their jobs because of the recovery bill that we passed that did successfully help this country stay out of a Great Depression. You know, sometimes, Mr. Garamendi, I'm amazed at the rhetoric that you hear from some people, particularly on the other side, who blindly tell people that the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act was $770 billion that didn't make a difference. The fact is 40% of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, so as to pass the Senate where we needed Ms. Senator Collins and Senator Snow's votes, were the Republican proposed, endorsed, and loved tax cuts. How can they talk out of both sides of their mouths and say that a bill that 40 percent of which, which means over about $300 billion of tax cuts, didn't do any good? Because now all they talk about is tax cuts. But when the President of the United States proposes and the Congress with him in a bipartisan effort passes tax cuts, and I'm not sure the American Recovery and Investment Act was bipartisan. That was strictly Democrat. But when we passed tax cuts with a few Republicans in the Senate, it didn't create any jobs in their mind. But when they propose tax cuts, this is Christopher Columbus's new way to find the new world. Well, it's hypocritical. We need to support our president because he is the president. There isn't a red America and a blue America. There is, as he said in the speech in the 2004 Democratic Convention, the United States of America. And people need to understand that. We need to be here for that red, white, and blue flag for this country to put this country back to work, to keep it as the most competitive country in the world so we don't fall behind China and India in engineering and science and coming up with programs that give our children an opportunity to be able to fill the jobs of the 21st century. The green jobs that the President's proposed that are the jobs of the 21st century and the technology jobs that we haven't done a good enough job in filling. Giving money to colleges to do the research for industry to create jobs. In our caucus yesterday we had Joseph Stiglitz a Nobel Prize winning economist. I read Krugman a lot, Nobel Prize winning economist. Both say basically the same thing. The austerity programs proposed by the other side don't work. They've used them in Japan, didn't work. Greece, England, didn't work, unless you're in the upper 1%. If you wear a crown and you're the queen, or the prince, or the leaders of whatever, it works. But in this country, we don't have that kind of royalty. But we're starting to have a separate society with the upper 1%, who the Republican Party won't raise their taxes no matter what, and the rest of the country. Well, the President's right. We need to think about the whole country. We need to come together as a United States of America, not a red a blue, a Democrat, or a Republican, and create jobs. The President's plan includes over half of it is tax cuts. And our colleagues on the other side of the aisle say, well, we can go for what we like there, even though they said it didn't work when the President and the Democrats passed it in the Recovery Act, but they can't go for the infrastructure jobs. That, of course, help businesses, trucking businesses, airline industries, transportation industry, Automobiles have to, trucks have to have highways. So we need to pass this, and I support the president. I took an oath, do what I could to make this country better. We need to come together now because this is a crisis time. Uh, Mr. Cohen, thank you so very much. And your experience uh, from the um, great Midwest along America's great river is, is really important for us to understand. We really have an opportunity here. Right now, this legislation is before Congress and the Senate, and we have an opportunity for a better deal for America. It's an investment in America. We talked about the infrastructure. That's an investment that will last for 50, 100 years because it's in the ground. It's the roads, the sanitation system. It's also a critical investment in tomorrow's workers, in our children. The American Jobs Act has money for 280,000 teachers. 280,000 teachers will be able to stay on the job. Right now in California, teachers are getting laid off, as they are in most other states of this nation. That means that classroom sizes are going up. That means that the educational opportunity for our children is diminishing. 
We have no more important investment. Roads are important, bridges are important, but the most important investment of all in any society, in any economy, is the investment in education in the children, in tomorrow's workforce. 280,000 teachers will be able to stay in the classroom. This money flows directly, directly to the school districts. Not a big administrative task at all, but one that goes there directly. Small businesses. Our Republican colleagues love to talk about small businesses. And they say correctly, most jobs are created by small business. That's true. That's accurate. 64% of the new jobs over the past 15 years created by small businesses. But what are they doing for small businesses? Cutting the contracts that the small businesses depend upon as they push an austerity budget. The American Jobs Act takes a different path. And it tells small businesses, you get an immediate tax break. 3.1% of your payroll tax will be eliminated in the next year. That's a lot of money, and I'll explain how much it is. And in addition to that, if you hire a long-term unemployed worker, your entire payroll tax will disappear. Let me tell you what that means. Let's take a, a warehouse. You've got warehouses in your area. You talked about roads and trains and the we like. We've got lots of warehouses. Lots of warehouses. They're full of uh, goods ready to go on Federal Express planes to service the rest of this nation. It all starts in Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, goes I out I thought they there. might have some of that Tennessee whiskey in them. Some of that, too. Huh? That, too. So, anyway, a warehouse with a payroll last year of $7 million that this year hires 40 new workers. It would add $2 million to its payroll it would get a full refund of the 6.2% payroll taxes paid on the $2 million of payroll. How much is that? That's $124,000 that goes immediately to the bottom line of that warehouse. And in addition to that, they've already seen a 3.1% reduction, okay, actually it's a 50% reduction in their payroll tax for the workers that were already there and that's another 155,000. So we're looking here at $279,000 of reduced expenses, taxes to that company. That means that they can improve the warehouse. That means they could expand. That means that they could even hire more workers. This is in the President's American Jobs Program, specifically for small businesses. Listen up, America. Listen up, businesses out there. There is an opportunity here for you to immediately expand your business, reducing your payroll taxes, hiring new workers, bringing a new worker on that's been long-term unemployment, and paying no payroll taxes for the next year. This is very, very important and very big, and it's immediately available as soon as the leadership, the Republican leadership in this House, brings the American Jobs Bill to the floor. Mr. Cohen, if you'd like to carry on here, I know you have some more thoughts. Well, just the, the whole prospect, jobs is so important. I was thinking back about Stiglitz, and you, you, I think you were there at the caucus, and he and Krugman say the same thing, that there are several ways you can get yourself out of this deficit. He went back a little bit of history and how during the Clinton years, we'd had a big deficit from the Reagan-Bush years, and that President Clinton, with a, a bill that was passed in this Congress with all Democrat votes in about 1994, I believe it was, or 93, some with 94, I think, put us on a road that balanced the budget and got us a surplus. Got us a surplus by the time President Clinton left office. And Stiglitz said, which is so true, it's a fact. It's a factoid. The, but, the, 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 the surplus was lost because two wars, one of which was a volunteer war, not related to 9-11, Iraq and Afghanistan, that were both passed through these Congresses, which were republicanly controlled, Republican Congresses, without being funded. And then the Bush tax cuts, giving the wealthiest people the largest tax cuts and contributing to the largest disparity in wealth, disparity in wealth that we've ever had in this nation. Now, the wealthy can only spend so much. There are only so many Chanel purses a woman can buy. There are only so many Rolex watches a guy can have. And there's just so much. But we are losing a middle class. 
And because we put all this wealth through these tax cuts on the richest, making their tax rates to the lowest since the 1950s, and then extended for two years the inheritance tax to where the wealthy get to keep more and more in perpetuity, the middle class is disappearing in this country. Jobs are being shipped overseas. Taxes stay high on them. They're living paycheck to paycheck. They've got their children in school. Pell grants are endangered. They almost were reduced in the last, last month or two. But we, we salvaged them in the, in the final bill. Uh, people are having trouble making ends meet. And the middle class has got to be there to be a consumer group. If you don't have consumers, you can't have an economy to service people who are making goods and services. You've got to have a customer. We're losing the customer base. We can ship all the jobs we want off to, to Southeast Asia and China where they don't pay any salaries and don't give any benefits, but those people aren't our market. And if our people can't buy goods, then we're not going to have any manufacturing base and the opportunity to make it in America. So we've got to build up the middle class. We've got to produce jobs. And we've got to see to it that the middle class is given priority and not the richest 1%. The president's plan, which is so great is it's all paid for. It's paid for, but paid for by a tax that's appropriate for the people who can afford it. Tell us how we can deal with that and well, keep this as a paid for program. I've been kind of shuffling the boards down here because you went through several subjects along the way and each one is so, so terribly important and pertinent to the issue. Uh, but I think I could wrap it all up in this and that is America lost about 50% of its manufacturing jobs in the last 20, 25 years. We went from 20, 21 million manufacturing jobs to just over 10 million today. But we can once again rebuild the American manufacturing sector. That's where the middle class jobs are. You, you talked about tax policy, that the tax uh, policy has shifted from um, one that was broad-based in which the wealthy and everybody participated in it in a uh, progressive mechanism in which now the wealthy, and, and Warren Buffett has said it so very well, he actually pays a lower tax rate than does his secretary. And he said, this is wrong. This is upside down and wrong. And he's quite correct. But if we take a look at the manufacturing sector of America and we apply a couple of principles, that is, we're going to buy American. And this has to do with our policies of uh, uh, all of these policies here, trade policies, We've been giving it away in these international trade deals on the taxes. Just talked about that. The tax burden has shifted from the wealthy down to the middle class, further eroding the purchasing power and the status of the middle class. So much so that today's, uh, just yesterday, the um, Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, came out with a report that the poverty level in America has reached the highest level in 52 years. That's the pushing down of the American middle class so that those at the bottom have been pushed out of the middle class into poverty. One, out of, one, out, of six, one out of six adults. Think about that. One out of six adults. Now, this body, of which I am extremely proud to be a member of, is not representative of America. Because if it was, one out of six, or 74 people, would be earning $22,000 a year or less for a family of four. So that doesn't happen. One out of five children in this country is now living in poverty. They're in my district, and people can't get along without having a job. Exactly right. 22 million children living in poverty, not knowing where their next meal is going to come from. And at the same time, they're cutting the food programs. Oh, this is our program. This is the president's program. Every one of the things that is in the American Jobs Act is here. Taxes, there are tax breaks for businesses, and this entire program is paid for, paid for by ending the giveaway of our tax money to the oil companies. Four billion dollars a year, 40 billion dollars over the next decade of our tax money going to support the oil industry, the wealthiest industry in the world. How about the hedge fund guys? You know, there's another Steve Cohen. There's the one in New York that's got all the money, the hedge fund guy, billions and billions of dollars. What does he pay on his income? Well, he pays 15%. Somehow or the other, they got into the law, the hedge fund folks that are making hundreds of millions of dollars or a, a year, even in some cases billions, are paying 15% on their income. Now, they got it classified as capital gains when, in fact, it is, the, uh, the, it is their labor, that is, their work, 
as you and I are working here or as people are working in the manufacturing plants, it's their work, but it's taxed at 15 percent, not at 35 or 38 percent. You know, what's that all about? And well, we're going to end that tax break, and that's about $17 billion a year. Right. Oh, excuse me, over 10 years. Yeah, and that shouldn't exist. I mean, that's absurd. There's another Steve Cohen, the magician, and apparently he had something to do with the tax code when they took care of the other Steve okay. Cohen. So taxes are part of it. The energy policy, we haven't talked about that. We've talked about labor putting men and women back to work. And the education system, 280,000 new teachers or teachers in the classroom, research and infrastructure. This is part of the Make It in America agenda, which can be carried out with the American Jobs Act. So if we pass the American Jobs Act, we've got a really good opportunity to once again make things in America because the legislation calls for about $50 billion in um, infrastructure and another establishment of an infrastructure bank for sanitation, water systems, uh, internet, uh, high-speed cable systems, all of those kinds of things in the infrastructure bank. So we may be looking at 60, 70 billion dollars a year of investment in these infrastructure projects and coupled with that is a buy America, make it in America, buy American made buses, American made locomotives, the concrete and steel in the bridges, that's going to be American made. I could tell you one of the greatest horror stories about infrastructure, it's right in San Francisco just outside my district, the San Francisco Bay Bridge, a multi-billion dollar rebuilding of the Bay Bridge because it falls down in an earthquake did once, we don't want it to happen again, multi-billion dollars. The contract to save 10 percent went to Chinese steel companies. All of the steel manufacturing in that bridge comes from China. Thousands of jobs in China and to make things worse, the inspectors were done over there and they didn't do a good job and beyond that, when the bridge parts came over here, Chinese workers came with the bridge. No more of that. We're going to make it in America. I've got a bill in, others are working on this, and that is if it's American taxpayer money, by God, it's going to be used to buy American taxpayer goods and services. We can do this, and the first step is the American Jobs Act. Well, and you, you, know, you mentioned on there, I look at your chart, education, part of the American Jobs Act is to rebuild our, our schools and to go to work and, and make them uh, structurally and, and also energy efficient. And when you look at labor, it's work. But, you know, the labor movement's been attacked all over this country, and it's labor who's created the middle class and seen to it that they got good jobs and, and, and good, good opportunities and wages and benefits. In my community, we just had a grocery store taken over by a, a large national grocery store, took out a, 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 a grocery store from another city that had come in and taken over some local owners. The people who'd worked there, one man had worked there for 44 years. He'd been making 9.85 an hour and working 40 hours a week. They came in and said, you can work 16 hours, you'll get 750 an hour, you won't get your benefits that you had accumulated, and you'll go to another store. He quit. They did a lot of employees that way. What happened yesterday, help inform me, because I heard this and I kind of, it was difficult to believe. Bank America, what did they do? They, they, did they make something like $7 billion last year? And how many people did they lay off yesterday? They're talking about laying off 40,000 people across America so, in the next year. So how does that jive with what we hear from the other side about just trust business to hire people that the jobs come from business and the private sector? They're making $7.8 billion. They benefited from the TARP, a bipartisan George Bush, President Bush, Secretary Paulson plan that I supported in a bipartisan manner that we kept Bank of America alive. I think they're on the hook maybe since some federal recent uh, action considering their, their loans and all, but seven billion, and they're laying off 30 to 40,000 people? Those people are going to need unemployment benefits. And it's not because they don't want a job. They've been put out. And a lot of qualified, good people who can do jobs and are intelligent and don't have jobs because they're not there. But the people at the top are making more money than ever. They're eating at Massa in New York. They're eating the $500 dinner at the Japanese restaurant and not thinking twice about it. And they're firing people right and left. The limousines are still moving. The wealthy are still doing whatever they've been doing. They got their jets. They're not the football team, they're private jets. They're living great.
but America's being, the American dream is disappearing. And the American dream disappeared for my grocery workers, it's disappearing for Bank of America employees, it's disappearing for a lot of people. Well, the American public, through the TARP program, bailed out Wall Street, bailed out the banks. And the banks have done nothing. The big Wall Street banks have done nothing except enrich themselves at the expense of the American taxpayer. Those days should be over. We need to move in a different direction. One of the groups we really need to help are those men and women that have been fighting the wars. Now, my personal view is that the war in Afghanistan ought to stop tomorrow. We ought to bring that $120 billion a year that we're spending in Afghanistan, bring it back here, invest it in America in education and in bridges, infrastructure, and debt relief. $120 billion a year in Afghanistan. And we're still spending a vast amount of money in Iraq. End those wars. Bring, those, bring that money home. Bring the soldiers home. And when we do, we're bringing home a lot of wounded Americans. Professor wounded Americans who need our respect and who need jobs. In the American Jobs Act, in the American Jobs Act is a special place for veterans. Special advantage. They deserve it. They're the ones that have sacrificed. They're the ones that took time out of their lives to fight those wars. Whatever we may think about those wars, we can only think good thoughts and honor the veterans. And here's a way to do it. There are 877,000 unemployed veterans in America today. Nearly a million. 877,000 looking for work. In the American Jobs Act, there is a very special tax credit available to any employer, any employer who hires a veteran. You can reduce your taxes by $5,600. Right off the bottom, $5,600 tax credit. Not a deduction, but a credit. And if you happen to hire one of those wounded vets, we know them. We've seen their pictures. We know what post-traumatic stress syndrome is all about. Hire a wounded vet, and it's a $9,600 tax credit to every employer, whomever it happens to be across this nation. Now, that's what we need to do. All the talk about balancing the budget, all the talk about a deficit, hasn't put one person to work in America. In fact, it has laid off hundreds of thousands of people. We need to put America back to work. The American Jobs Act does that, and it does it in a very special way for those Americans that have been out there sacrificing in Iraq, in Afghanistan. It gives them an opportunity. It gives every employer an incentive to hire those workers. We owe it to these men and women. And when these men and women go back to work, they become taxpayers. And when men and women in America go back to work and become taxpayers, then the deficit will be resolved. Then we will solve the deficit. We need to make cuts. We need to do those things. But those are in the out years. Right now, it is about jobs. The president has given us the legislation. The question, the question for our Republican leadership here, they control this House. They're the ones that set the agenda. They're the only ones that can bring a bill to the floor. When will you bring the American Jobs Act to this floor so that we can put Americans back to work? Mr. Cohen, I know how deeply you feel about this. I know that in your district, your people that you represent are hurting. They want jobs. We're going to wrap this up in just a few moments, so our closing remarks and We'll Thank you, Mr. Gehrman. I, we do. We, I, every, every weekend I'm home, and the weeks that I'm home, because we're home many weeks now, and this Congress doesn't work them very much. We spend a lot of time at home, and that's a, a beautiful thing for us, but not a great thing for America, because we need to be here working on trying to get a jobs bill passed, which hadn't been introduced by the majority yet. But Professor Stiglitz talked about the causes of the loss of the surplus that the President Clinton and the Democrat Congress got in the late part of the 20th century. It was the two wars voted for by this Congress, supported by President Bush, the Bush tax cuts passed by this Congress, proposed by President Bush, and Medicare Part D, President Bush's Medicare plan to take care of the insurance companies. That's what did it.
Those were the causes. The veterans, Professor Stiglitz, and he's got a lady who works with him. I think her name is Linda Bilmus. And they, 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 they've studied what it's going to cost in America in the years to come with the veterans. Now, the ones we can employ, we need to employ. But the ones that come back, 1% to 2% are going to come back disabled. And they're going to need veteran services and going to need money the rest of their lives. So these wars, particularly the Iraq War, President Bush and the Republican Congress's war, is going to cost this country for another 70 years at minimum. 70 years. And we need to be prepared for that. We need to come together. And there's no question that when, as Professor Stiglitz said, when you can borrow money at like 1 or 2% and make a greater percentage on it, this is the time that you borrow because rates are so low. Economics and the top people in economics say this whole idea of the austerity and the cut and the cut is wrong. What does it do? It helps the wealthy because they're uh, immune to it. Their benefit from the low-cost labor they get overseas and the salaries they get here, they get great tax rates, helps them. But what else does it help? It helps what Senator McConnell said was the number one job of this Congress the first day after President Obama was elected, to defeat President Obama. That's what Senator Mitch McConnell said was the number one priority that he had. And he's a focused man. I admire him for the fact that he gets an issue and he stays on it and he's focused. And he thought that and thinks that when he works on debt ceiling, when he works on the deficit, when he works on the American Jobs Act. It's all about one thing, not employing Americans, but taking one American, two Americans, Barack Obama and Joe Biden, and making them unemployed. That's not pr appropriate. Well, we have a different view here. Uh, I'm confident that the president will be reelected because he understands very clearly that we need to put Americans back to work. And he's given us the American Jobs Act, complete legislation. All the sections are there. All the writing is done. All the legal work is done. It is now before the United States Congress and the Senate. And it's up to us. 435 of us in this House. Are we ready to act? Are we ready to do what Americans want us to do? And that is to put them back to work. Pass the bill. Pass the bill. Pass the bill. Put Americans back to work. I quickly go through some of the uh, parts of this bill and the way in which they affect Americans. It's about investment. Investing in our infrastructure. Fifty billion dollars directly available for the transportation sector. Rail, high-speed rail, inner-city rail, bridges, roads. Fifty billion dollars available this year to put men and women back to work repairing our, our transportation infrastructure. Another ten billion dollars for an infrastructure bank in which the pension funds of America, the public pension funds could invest in perhaps another 20 or 30 billion dollars in that infrastructure bank to once again augment the development of the infrastructure that we need, water systems, sanitation systems, uh, all of those uh, communication systems that we desperately need. That's on the infrastructure side. On the education side, repairing our schools, 35,000 schools to be repaired, repainted, classrooms, uh, science laboratories, as well as the playgrounds. 35,000 schools out there. Your neighborhood school, the opportunity for it to have a new paint job, a new bathroom, whatever's needed. And 280,000 teachers, 280,000 teachers. You could fill the entire stadium in Ann Arbor, Michigan, football, 100,000, and still have a third game with only 80,000 people in it. 280,000, think of it. The Ann Arbor, Michigan Stadium filled 2.8 times over. Teachers in the classroom, this is exciting. Veterans, in a, a very 
powerful incentive where a business can reduce its tax burden. That is the bottom line tax reduced by $9,600 when you hire a disabled veteran. That man, that woman's going back to work, becoming a taxpayer. Once again, pride in our nation. This is powerful for the unemployed and extension of unemployment benefits, and we didn't even get to that today. And all of this in the context of rebuilding the American manufacturing sector. More than 10 million American manufacturing jobs have been lost in the last two decades. We can put them back to work if we use our public policy, use our tax money that's going to build those bridges, those roads, buses and locomotives. Use our tax money to buy American-made, American-made equipment. All it takes is a law, and it works. Sacramento, California, near where I live, has built, or Siemens, a German company, has built a major manufacturing plant in Sacramento, California, to manufacture light rail cars and Amtrak locomotives. Why did they do that? They did that because the American Recovery Act, the stimulus bill that our Republican colleagues like to trash, said that the money for transportation systems, buses, light rail, and trains, must be spent on American-made equipment. So Siemens said, well, if that's the law, we want the business. They built the plant. And they're manufacturing light rail cars and locomotives today in America using American equipment, using America workers. That's what we can do if we are willing to pass the laws to make it in America. Photovoltaic systems, wind turbines, all of these things supported with our tax dollars. Why not use those tax dollars to buy American-made solar cells and wind turbines? The president has given us the opportunity to do what we should do as representatives of the American people. Put Americans back to work. Pass the American Jobs Act. Pass the American Jobs Act. Mr. Cohen, wrap this up for us. I just thank you, Mr. Garamendi, for the leadership and, and putting this hour together and allowing me to join you. And let's say it together. Pass the bill. Pass the bill. Mr. Speaker, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gohmert, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It never ceases to be an honor to me to be able to speak on this floor. The freedoms we have, the blessings we've received because of those who've gone before us. The country's in trouble. People around the world cannot believe that the greatest nation in the history of mankind just cannot make itself live within its means. So businesses, manufacturing have flocked away from America. I know there are some who believe that the greatest thing that can happen for America is for those manufacturing jobs to leave America because they believe, gee, they they hurt the environment because they pollute, so just as well they go to some other third world country or China or other place. When the truth is, apparently, when those same manufacturing companies leave the United States, they go to nations that on average pollute, depending on the nations, four to ten times more 
than we do here in the United States. And for those that understand the way the world turns, as uh, pollution goes up in Asia, we usually breathe it here in the United States. So that hasn't worked out so well for the environment of the planet. We're hurting the planet as we drive manufacturing jobs out of America. And this administration has used the EPA as a sword, as a tool to drive more and more manufacturing and production out of the United States, hurting the country more and more. Not because necessarily they want to intentionally hurt the country. I'm not saying that. They just think we're better off if they're not willing to have a draconian EPA being, as the press, uh, president said in his speech, working side by side with them in private business. Good riddance. Go somewhere else. Because in the president's own words, that's what he said, and it was the scariest thing I heard that the president said last week, standing right here at the second level in this hall. The line, and I'll read from his speech directly, uh, he said, we need to look for ways to work side by side with America's businesses. America's businesses do not need a government that wants to be their partner. The government in this country, according to the Constitution, metaphorically speaking, is supposed to be a referee. Keep the playing field fair, keep it level, make sure everybody has a chance to compete and compete fairly, and stay out of the way. Do not interfere. Don't try to be a partner with business. Stay out of the way and be a referee. It's when this United States government has tried to be a partner that so often it gets in trouble and it kills businesses and it kills jobs and people flee and go to some other country where they're allowed to produce things without the government trying to be their partner. Anybody that wants the government to be their partner should go to Venezuela or third world nations. They're more than happy to partner with that biz those businesses. But uh, some years back, there was a group of us that went to China, and we met with a number of CEOs of international corporations that have taken their American jobs by the thousands, taken their businesses, their manufacturing, production, and gone to China. And I had the feeling that when we talked to them and asked them the question, why did you move all these jobs to China, that they would say, well, they just couldn't work with the labor unions, the price of labor was too high, regulations were too much. But the number one answer was because of the corporate tax. The corporate tax in America, in the United States, is the highest corporate tax in the world. Now, corporations, those that understand business law, corporations, directors, and officers have a fiduciary duty to their stockholders to try to make as much money as they can. And lest some, Mr. Speaker, do not know who the stockholders are, more and more, their union workers, their American workers across their countries, their small business owners and operators, franchise operators, they're the rank and file across the country. State employees, local employees, federal employees, but more than that, businesses across America. Uh, they have, a re have retirement accounts that invest in these companies. Well, those companies, officers and directors, have a fiduciary duty that they have to, or they could be sued, have the best interest of the company and the stockholders at stake in the decisions they make. You go to law school, I've hopefully saved somebody a lot of money. That's it in a nutshell. 
So when a group of corporate leaders are trying to decide how can we avoid being sued by the stock stockholders by doing the best thing to help them create the most revenue for their stock, what can we do? What will enhance their dividends? They have to look. And when they see the United States of America is taxing corporations at 35 percent, and they see that China taxes at 17 percent, you would think it was pretty much a no-brainer, and that's basically what they said. And I was gratified to hear that whether it's union labor or non-union labor, that across the board, the experience that the corporate leaders that I talk to in China say they're really their best workers are right here in the United States. Union workers, non-union workers, that generally speaking, they have better quality control over products produced here in the United States of America. And so when they move plants from here in the United States to other places like China, they have wonderful workers, but the quality control is not as good as what they have here. But if you think about it, and you realize, gee, they would pay half the corporate tax in China that they pay here by the billions, then they could afford to build state-of-the-art facilities where facilities here in the United States, their manufacturing plants, uh, may be falling apart and getting older. Well, you could go build a state-of-the-art facility in a place like China, and uh, because of the tremendously reduced corporate tax, uh, by the time you really get around to paying much tax, you've paid for the plant. And I was advised privately that it was possible the Chinese government would make deals with some companies if they were big enough. And it might be, for example, they would say, look, you move your manufacturing plant, hire these thousands of employees here in China instead of in the United States, and we'll make a deal with you. No corporate tax for five years. And then depending on the company and the negotiations, they might say, and then at the next five years, maybe 5 7%, maybe 10%. And then uh, maybe then it goes to 17 or maybe in another, uh, by 15 years, you get to the 17% rate. But in those kind of scenarios, they say, you know, we paid for a state-of-the-art facility by the time we ever get around to paying corporate tax. Whereas if we kept those jobs in America, facilities getting older, uh, we just can't produce dividends and returns on money for stockholders. Uh, we're just treading water. Here, we could, uh, because ha the corporate rates are half as expensive, then we can produce, we can compete anywhere in the world. Our goods are that much cheaper. Now, it is true, our labor is more expensive. But in general, we have good laborers in this country. And there are Americans that are willing to work, willing to do the jobs. Uh, from talking to employers, though, we could use a lot more uh, people willing to be employees who can pass a drug test. That's kind of important. And I've had so many constituents say, look, you know, you have to pass a drug test in order to get employment most important jobs nowadays whether it's with a grocery company back home or, or a small operator. I was talking to an independent um, oil, oil man that drills wells this afternoon from Longview, Texas, and he was saying, we have to give people drug tests. And he was telling me, uh, because of the drilling that's currently going on in East Texas, he's having trouble finding enough workers right now today while people are unemployed around the country, he's having trouble right now today finding enough people who can pass a drug test and are willing to work hard on an oil well. And uh, he put them to work. And in fact, uh, he was telling me this afternoon, they'd start out at $50,000 a year. They'd have health care. Um, it's hard, dirty long hours, tough work, but it's a good living. But so many of the people that apply can't pass a drug test. And because it's such 
difficult work physically, and it requires that you be alert because all of the other people on the rig have to count on each other, kind of like in a military operation. The equipment is so dangerous, if somebody has taken drugs and is not at peak performance, they get somebody killed. It's happened far too many times. They have to have people pass a drug test. But, I mean, that's just this afternoon. Well, think about it. If uh, we had manufacturers coming back into America because the corporate tax rate was less than 17 percent, then the manufacturing jobs show up like crazy. Now, I realize that from hearing all the news, apparently the big emphasis of the national union leaders, who sure don't seem to be speaking to all the union folks I know, but, but their emphasis seems to be basically we're not doing very well getting union members uh, from, from private corporations. So they've gone all after government employees. Let's try to unionize government employees because maybe we can pick them up. And what I think eventually rank-and-file union workers for private companies will begin to understand is it seems that they're being thrown under the bus. Um, the concentration seems to be more for more government workers, less private workers, which means they're driving for more jobs in the government sector, which kills off the private sector, which will kill off those jobs for the union members who have jobs in the private sector. So as I struggled, I listened, sat back here listening to the President's speech last Thursday night, and as I struggled with what the President was saying, because some of it didn't, didn't seem to me that it was going to create the jobs he was promising, but I was willing to wait for the bill. Uh, and not judge for a speech, because it's been said around here before, CBO cannot score a speech. Well, that was before a couple years ago when the administration got on to them, and then basically they did score a speech. But that's because the White House is able to exert pressure on CBO that uh, the Republicans have not been able to see fit to do. And I know Mr. Elmendorf was not happy with my reference, but the fact is, after Mr. Elmendorf met with the president in the woodshed or the Oval Office, uh, he came back and was able to bring down the scoring of Obamacare by about a quarter of a million dollars or so. And then after Obamacare passed, then they said, whoops, we looks like maybe we underestimated by about a quarter of a, I'm sorry, a uh, quarter of a trillion dollars. So anyway, um, that makes for a pretty big plus or minus margin of error when CBO can't do better than that. But CBO and the rules were created by uh, the most liberal Congress in the history uh, until about five years ago. And uh, they created CBO. They created the rules for scoring. They um, yanked us out of Vietnam without a chance to make sure our allies there would not be killed, so most of them were. And uh, they also created a automatic, an automatic baseline for government budgets that increases every year. They created a formula, it increases every year. Now, I was here in 05 and 06, and I am embarrassed that as Republicans, uh, our party did not have the nerve to eliminate CBO, to eliminate the ridiculous rules by which bills are scored, so that actual reality and history and recurrent uh, numbers of what happens when you do this, you get this effect. You can't consider that. They have to use rules that don't apply in the real world and without taking in consideration the effects that have been had when an action is taken every time. So we get terribly inaccurate scoring from a government entity, and we also have this automatic baseline that increases every year. There's not a business or home in America 
that can plan a budget by saying we're automatically going to increase our budget every year from now on, no matter how much income or revenue we have each year, we're going to keep increasing our budget. And that's what's been happening for 37 years since 1974. And I'm extremely gratified that our bright chairman of the budget, uh, the budget chairman back in 05 and 06 was not willing to do it, but this budget chairman is going to do it. And that is this year, uh, he's going to take up a zero baseline budget. I've been filing one my first Congress back in 05 and 06, my second Congress, 07 and 08, my third Congress, uh, 09 and 2010, and this Congress. And uh, I am delighted. I don't care whose name's on the bill, but when we finally eliminate the automatic increases in, in the federal budgets every year, that's going to be huge. And it's going to be better than anything that the president's proposed by way of uh, producing revenue and, and balancing the budget. But we were able, and I do appreciate the White House uh, emailing uh, their version of the American Jobs Act. Uh, and if I might inquire of the uh, speaker for parliamentary inquiry, uh, if there are charts around on the floor, can anybody use those? Uh, the gentleman's